or Greek, it doesn't matter. Whether Whether he be wise or educated or uneducated, whether he be rich or poor, there is only one solution for man's sinful problem, and that solution is found in Jesus Christ. And then in verse 17, he defines this gospel in one phrase. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Please note, it is the righteousness of God. What does he mean by that? It is a righteousness planned by God. It is a righteousness prepared by God without any human contribution. And you will see this as you go into more detail in chapter 3, verses 21 and onwards. Amen. It is a righteousness that is made available by God himself. So I want this to be clear. In the New Testament, we read that it is God who takes the initiative for our salvation. The gospel is not conditional good news. The gospel doesn't say to the world and to you and me, you first have to be good, or you first must clean yourself up and make yourself available to me, then I will save you. That's not what the gospel is. When we come to chapter 5, and turn with me to chapter 5, let's look very quickly at verses 6 through 8. Chapter 5. This, brothers and sisters, is the power of the gospel. This is what God has done for you and I. We hear the good news of Christ, that Christ is our righteousness, and we realize that outside of Christ, I am nothing but a sinner, and I can't change that. I have no power over sin. I am a slave to the devil. This is why Paul said, I'm a slave to Jesus Christ. Because in this life, you better understand that you only have the two choices. You're going to either be a slave to God in His righteousness, or you're going to be a slave to the devil in this world. Amen. It's the only choice you have. Right? So what, what I'm hearing you say, it's not 99% God and 1% me, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, okay. Right. So it's 100% God. Yes. Oh, okay. This righteousness comes from God. Let's look at Romans 5, verses 6 through 8. For when we were still without what? Strength to do what? Strength to overcome sin. Right? For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for me. Who am I? I'm the ungodly. I have no power. I can't save myself. As Ray said, it's not 99% God and I have to supply the other 1%. It is 100% God what God has done. This is the good news. And that's why it's so good. It's because it's God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish. Why? Because God has made a way of salvation. And this is why faith is so important. Amen. Listen, let's be clear on this. It's not your faith that saves you. It's who your faith is placed in. It's Christ who saves you. Is that clear? Okay. So for when we are still without strength, in due time Christ died for, died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. Verse 8. If you mark your Bibles, and this is Mark, mark it. But God demonstrates His own what? Love. It's God's love that has done all of this. But God demonstrates His own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. It is a righteousness that is made available by God Himself. God takes the initiative for our salvation. The gospel is not conditional. Chapter 5, verses 5 and 6, we discover that while we were helpless, incapable of saving ourselves, while we were ungodly, while we were enemies, and while we were sinners, God reconciled to Himself by the death of His Son, all of us, the world. When Jesus died, did he die just for the elect? Or did he die for the whole world? Brothers and sisters, we are not Calvinists. And we don't teach that Calvinistic doctrine. This is one of the things that you have to grasp 
more than up here, but it has to start to get to down here, that in Christ, he took on humanity, and he took it corporately, so that in his death, all humanity died with him. Amen. And so, in his resurrection, all humanity can live with him. Mm -hmm. But the Bible calls it a free gift. He died for the whole world, doesn't mean the whole world's going to be saved. Why? Because you have to accept the gift. And that acceptance comes by faith. Faith in what Christ did. That I don't look to myself, that I look totally to Him. And I grasp Him, and I hold Him, and I will never let Him go. Why? Because He'll never let me go. Amen. God reconciled us to Himself by the death of, death of His Son. It is God who takes the initiative. Now, brothers and sisters, the world is desperately waiting for the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was planned by God. It was prepared by God in His Son, Jesus Christ, and it was made available by Him. God takes the initiative. He gets all the credit and all the glory. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. In other words, what Paul is trying to present in this book is the unconditional good news of salvation, which he prepared for us in his Son, Jesus Christ. That, of course, is the grand theme of all of the Bible, Old and New Testament together. But nowhere is it set forth so clearly and argued so masterfully as in the Epistle to the Romans. In this book, the Apostle Paul unfolds to us this whole counsel and wisdom of God. He presents to us our sin problem and man's sinful condition. He gives us the truth about Christ, His life and His death as our substitute and our surety. He describes faith in Christ as the basis of making that salvation effective or the solution to our sin problem. Then He goes on to the work of the Holy Spirit in our sanctification. He also describes the place of God's people in this world. We have a work to do in this world and He describes that. Lastly, He gives practical applications to the gospel in daily living and Christian life. This book, the book of Romans, as well as the book of Galatians, the Galatians we're going to study for this whole 14-week quarter. Mm -hmm. Listen, I beg you, come to the Sabbath school class. Avail yourself of what is going to be presented. And we're also going to be going through the book of Romans. Hand in hand. This is done. There should be no confusion about what God has called us for, what we're here to do, and our surety in Jesus Christ. Also, why God raised this church up, and what our message is for today, and why it has to be given now. The question is, do you want to be those people to give it? Closing him this morning is in number 223.
committee um, thing. I have the, the names here. We're going to vote on them so that we can start this process. It's going to be Ricky, Linda, Diana, Mary Jane, Carl. That's it. Five. Five. Two alternates. And two alternates, which is uh, Lynn and Donald. Uh, I make a motion we accept this. All in favor, raise your hand. Okay. Well, let's bow our heads as we close. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the truths that you have given us in your holy word. And Father, I pray that as we continue to study through the book of Galatians and the book of Romans, that the fire that set the world ablaze will once again be seen, that that fire will be your Holy Spirit in the lives of your people, that we will be changed, that we will put away that sin that so does easily beset us, and that we will give our hearts fully and completely to you. Father, I pray that revival will come and it will start right here with me and with your people gathered here this morning. Father, bless us and bring us back if it's your will. For this we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.